Good morning and welcome to this event, Shaping the EU's Transition, Citizens Take the Floor. And this is what we're going to be doing today. Over the past few months, we have citizens gathering through two different processes. In one, we have the Parliament peers. They gather with family and friends and they discuss it together about different issues related to the transition. And then we also have Citizens Dialogue reuniting citizens all across Europe with different social and economic backgrounds discussing as well. We have hundreds of events with thousands of uh, citizens participating. They were exchanging ideas, they were exchanging experiences as well, and coming with concrete proposals that they are going to be sharing today with policymakers to make sure that this is translated into action. We are live, we have interpretation in all the 23 languages, so you can choose your own to be able to follow and understand everything we're going to be talking today about. If you would like to share your own thoughts and ideas, you can do it using the hashtag Climate Pact, Just Transition and Citizens Voices. And if you would like to ask, to ask questions because we're going to be uh, able to listen to you during this event and you are live in the platform uh, be too much you can do it by leaving them on the chat now before we jump into the conversation with uh, the citizens i am thrilled to have today with me the executive vice president for the european green deal franz timmermans good morning good morning over the past few months, we have seen the Climate Pact, the Conference on the Future of Europe. The European Union is putting a lot of attention on participative democracy, on listening to the citizens. Why is so important to bring in them into the conversation about the green transition? Well, this transition affects everyone. It's going to impact everyone's life. It's going to impact all our choices we make, what we, what we eat, how we live, how we move around. Um, and to uh, have the possibility to incorporate the citizens in the design uh, assures the support of the citizens once we have to implement it. Absolutely. We're going to be listening to those ideas for citizens today. So stay with us because we're going to start with energy. Energy has become a central issue over the past few weeks and we are going to be talking about how can citizens contribute to the conversation that we are having and how to ensure a green transition. And for that, I'm very happy to have here with me Marcos, who is a Climate Pack ambassador from Spain, and Emma, who is a spokesperson on Citizens' Voices from France. But before I ask you about the conclusions that you have reached during your conversations, I want to ask again the Executive Vice President. We have seen how the energy crisis has become central to the mm -hmm. EU policymaking over the past few uh, weeks due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We have seen some trends shifting away from the green transition and a push for, uh, for European citizens to make sure that renewable energies are at the core of that transition. Why do you think it's so important to have this conversation with citizens and what does the EU have to say? Well, I think it's important that citizens understand that this energy transition will bring down the prices uh, of energy and they're paying incredible prices for energy today. It will make us more sovereign as Europeans. It will make us masters of our own energy uh, markets and it, it will make sure that the money doesn't go into the pockets of Putin but stays in Europe and can be invested in even more transition. So this is indeed an opportunity to move into a greener energy system. Marcus, I would like um, to start with you. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how the conversation was during your uh, dialogue and what are the conclusions that you reach on energy? Sí. Antes que nada, gracias por la, por la invitación. Gracias, señor vicepresidente. First of all, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. And thank you to all who are online following us. To answer your question, I have carried out seven EU parliaments, citizen parliaments, and the most of the people who have taken part in this are very committed, and they are very aware of climate change. So we've had a very active participation. One of the strongest conclusions that has been given to us is that citizens want more financial incentives for measures of energy efficiency. A lot of citizens want to take that step, but they can't financially. 
So this is one of the points that they asked us. They're very worried about the current economy, their own economy. The increase of the energy prices, of the fossil fuels prices, has given a boost to energy uh, efficiency measures are done in higher income families and segregation is being created. There should also be more awareness worship campaigns on the benefits of this and the benefits of uh, economy measures that should be done in the home. There should be more awareness about uh, energy efficiency, about uh, light bulbs, etc. They've also come to us to ask us that there should be a just transition, a fair transition, that no one is left behind in the, in the time. We should reach every citizen, older people or younger people, eliminating all differences in general. Other than that, there is also other points that worry them for people. And it's particularly for those who work in the fossil fuel industry, who also have should be given an opportunity to change jobs. It is paramount that there is a firm policy that goes in the same direction. The constant changes in uh, in the sense make the citizens distrust them. The changes in policy also create distrust. And climate change should be something that we fight independently of our political ideology. We should encourage citizens' participation generally and not only locally. Sometimes it is difficult for us to be taken seriously. We should also handle this with other, every civil platform. This would give more transparency and is a clear example of good governance and citizens' participation. We have, we can only imagine the citizens part taking part if we are listened to. We need them to take our opinion in consideration because otherwise it would be seen as an institutional greenwashing. The citizens in general and the civil society have to participate. They need to give their opinion. They need to mobilize to manage that the commitments and the agreements that are signed are fulfilled and implemented. As the Vice President of the European Union said when they invited us to be part of this Parliament, we can only triumph in the climate crisis if we all stick together. So, Vice Mr. Vice President, we need you and we all need ourselves. One of the key elements of Marcos' speech was about inequalities, yes. was about the social impact of the transition. Yes. This is a big part of the Ukrainian deal as well. Absolutely, because it is very clear in our society, if we allow those who are against climate policy to create a picture as though climate policy would be in opposition to social policy, then citizens will not follow this. So the climate policy has to be social policy. It is the big social question of our generation. Redistribution of everything we have in a fair way. And you, you were right to mention the energy crisis. You know, the people with the lowest income live in the worst houses. Uh, they relatively spend the most money on their energy bill. Not just because they have low income, but also because they have very energy inefficient housing very often. So improving their housing conditions changing, uh, putting solar PVs on their roofs, heat pumps. This should be a, partly also a public investment for people who rent houses so that they can see their energy bill go down immediately as soon as the housing is improved. That is the sort of thing we need to do now. That's how we need to, to, to recover from the present uh, crisis. And that's how you get people to understand that we will not leave them uh, 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 behind. We cannot afford to leave anyone behind. And because the poorest people are already in the worst condition, special attention for their situation needs to be core element of our politics.
I'm very happy that you mentioned housing because indeed that was at the core of the discussion that you had, Emma, right? Yes. Merci, Monsieur le Vice-Président Timmermans, de m'avoir donné l'occasion de présenter les résultats de délibération de nos concitoyens. Je m'appelle Emma, je suis citoyenne française, mais je m'adresse à vous en tant que citoyenne européenne. Je suis ici parce que je suis préoccupée par l'avenir. Ma génération est préoccupée par l'avenir et mes concitoyens européens le sont aussi. Je me tiens devant vous en tant que porte-parole d'un as a um, spokesperson i would like to talk to you about uh, energy um, it is not easy to include everyone's needs on the topic this is why we have had so many um, arguments during our conversations we've had so many people from so many ages from so many areas uh, rural urban areas older people younger people people living in flats or houses and so many people talked about their daily lives so it, they could relate to every single part of what was discussed um, landlords were uh, landlords who are not ready to uh, renovate buildings and even in uh, uh, lower income homes they are not ready to um, optimize energy um, solutions. How can we convince these people? How can we convince deciding people? Um, there is not always enough information online to um, find solutions. Um, why is it um, so complicated to find funding nowadays? We've had a hundred of arguments given during our conversations. We uh, gave you a, a, a small summary and I will give you some now as well. Nowadays, um, some people are not even sure about uh, the energy uh, transition and its necessity. If funding was uh, made lighter and easier, maybe uh, we could uh, find easier ways to um, uh, develop grants. Also, many um, enterprises, many firms uh, were not even um, taken as um, trusted for renovations. Could we use public infrastructure, infrastructure as a basis um, for um, capacity building and for training workers by showing the impact of um, energy uh, transition, we can um, encourage the private sector to work more in this direction. We can improve comfort, health and well-being of people in Europe. Public institutions can lead by example and uh, make their own energy consumption green. Um, this is what sh they should do. And w we also want, on top of development, we would like a sustainable commitment from institutions towards already existing um, investment possibilities. Many people today are frustrated because they um, invested in solar panels because they were promised a return on investment. Today, they uh, can no longer sell their energy. Investing more in innovation and in um, building trust would be worth it, but um, there should be um, um, an obligation on the long term anyway. Rules today um, only benefit a certain number of people. The number of people of richer people who have a, a um, a higher uh, salary and who are just taking advantage of the situation the way they have been making um, all the time, actually. Renovation should be um, should be financed um, at a hundred percent. In many cases, we would also like to have. Um, a better thought through financing scheme 
um, you have proposed to have one that is applied to um, countries, to regions, but we would like something that is more smart. Um, we would like from you that you can assure, um, assure us that uh, this transition will be fair, but fair for real and fair for everyone. You can promise as many times as you want that um, the that uh, the transition will be fair, but obviously it has not been fair until now. The social uh, the, um, social dimension of this is extremely important. Thank you a lot for listening to me. We would like a real energy transition. By the citizens, that there is a document already published with all of them, so you make. Just que vous sachiez, il y a un document qui a été publié avec beaucoup de initiatives très concrètes. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez euh, Comment est-ce que la Commission peut-elle s'assurer dans les années qui viennent Premièrement, le fardeau administratif. First of all, the administrative burden that we can solve with national authorities. The financial burden, there are ways to solve this with current prices of energy that are horrendous. If we compare energy traditional prices with renewable energy prices, renewable prices is much lower. So if we uh, do calculations house by house, we can see the, the difference for each house. So the rent will increase a little bit when we improve the house conditions, but the decrease in fuel or energy prices is much more important than the rise of the rent. So we must prove this to our citizens. And as you are saying, very rightly so, we need to show that national authorities can do that with their buildings. This is why I just uh, talked to Roma's mayor. He's starting with schools. Uh, you know, he's putting uh, photovoltaic panels, insulating uh, buildings, putting heat pumps. And this will reduce immensely the price of energy and increase uh, climate uh, conditions in schools. So if parents and children see that this brings advantages, they will be much more uh, convinced to do that at their own house. So these are uh, concrete examples of what we can do. Now we have a lot of questions coming from the audience uh, to you, Executive Vice President, and the first one is actually linked to what you were talking about, because they want to know how can the EU help citizens to reduce their energy consumption and achieve a fair transition. If we double, now we improve about 1% of the uh, buildings in Europe a year. Uh, in our plans, we want to double that. Uh, so if we double that, we save about 20 um, uh, a billion cubic meters of gas a year. So that's 20 billion cubic meters we don't have to buy from Putin, and that money stays in Europe and doesn't go uh, uh, to, to uh, Putin. At the same time, it drastically reduces the energy bill. Uh, I have, uh, from my own country, from the Netherlands, examples where people go from paying over 200 euros a month to paying 20 euros a month because they live in houses where they have solar panels and heat pumps and better uh, insulation. This, of course, needs huge investment. But this investment should, should be done also with a lot of public money in our recovery phase. And fortunately, many uh, member states have chosen in their recovery plans to also focus on the built environment, on homes and on, on official buildings. And I think that's, that's, that's how we can demonstrate to our citizens that this works and that it's in the interest of their, of their monthly payments to do that. For sure. I want to remind our audience that they are able to ask questions in their own language. We will have a team that is translating them and making sure that they come here and they are part of the conversation. We have another question, which is very relevant uh, in these days. There are a lot of member states who, um, who believe that uh, the uh, nuclear energy can be an alternative to coal. Some Scandinavians think that wood can be an alternative. What is your view on this? What we have agreed at the European Union level is that member states will reduce their emissions with at least 55% by 2030. And they can make their own choices in terms of their energy mix, how to get there. And some of these issues have advantages, some have disadvantages, all have advantages and disadvantages. 
The best choice is to go for photovoltaic and offshore wind. These are the best choice. And we can do incredible amounts of work with especially rooftop solar in, in European cities and you know, in all these industrial areas with these big buildings. You can cover them in solar panels. That would generate a huge amount of energy. Now, some member states will choose nuclear. But I have to say, I hope they will make a rational decision and make the good calculation because nuclear is very expensive. Nuclear has security issues, obviously. And before you get electricity out of a nuclear power plant, it takes you about 20 to 30 years before it's ready. And we need to have renewable and, and emission-free energy now. And the speed with which you can install solar panels and uh, wind farms is much bigger than with nuclear. And the risks are lower and the price of it is lower. So I hope people will make a rational choice. Some will still stick with nuclear. That's their own uh, national choice. That's their sovereign choice which energy mix they choose. But I hope they will go make a good calculation because at the end of the day, it's taxpayers' money. Especially in a context where we need a rapid transition, right? Would it be possible to deploy European financial aid for more research and development on sustainable energy technologies? Yes, and that's what we're doing with uh, uh, our, our programs such as Horizon and other programs. Because, for instance, uh, hydrogen will be a very, very important energy carrier in the future. That's where you store the energy from solar and wind uh, when you have peak production of solar and wind. That's for difficult to abate sectors. You can make cement with it and steel with it and aluminium with it, etc. But the making of this hydrogen is still very energy costly. So you need a lot of electricity to make hydrogen. We need to invest in technologies to improve that so that production of hydrogen electrolyzers become far more efficient. We also need to invest in better battery technology so that you need uh, that you make more um, uh, 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 batteries that can be, that can be recycled, uh, that you don't e use rare earth materials, that you go to solid state batteries that have a bigger performance and lighter weight. All these things, all these investments, that we, need, we need to make solar panels more innovative, recyclable, so that you don't, are not uh, uh, left with the waste. Wind turbines have to be more efficient, more recyclable. In all these areas, we invest massively, and I am amazed by the technical advances we see almost on a daily basis. One of the issues that Emma was highlighting before has been highlighted by many people in the questions as well, and is how do you can convince people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, because obviously the situation is not the same for everybody, to retrofit their house so that they actually are more efficient and they can actually save some money? I think this is an incredibly important question. Uh, what we see, in, in the, because the, there are huge differences between member states. Not every member state is in the same situation. But what you see is, is if you unburden people, so if you make it easier for them, if you create a situation, as you said, of trust, so they trust the companies, they trust the municipality, they trust the bank, they trust the agencies, if, if you can create that, it also unburdens them. If you can then also make it financially easy for them so that they don't have to take out loans themselves, uh, but they can make a calculation that this will be, um, uh, you, can, you can get this... Uh, uh, repaid within five years through your energy bill, for instance, and still the energy bill will be lower, and after five years it will be much lower again, because things like that. But you are also right, you have to be consistent. Pol politicians have to make policy that remains for a long period of time, because you, you came with the example that when people bought solar panels, the access electricity they could feed into the grid. Now, in some countries, this is still possible. In other countries, it is no longer possible that you can get paid for feeding it into the grid. This creates insecurity, and, and we need more consistency in these policies as well, and then you create more uh, self-assurance in people. You know, people, very often people um, like myself, I'm from a working-class background, my parents and grandparents would never, ever take out a loan for anything because they thought taking out a loan is a huge risk and we can't pay it off and then we will be uh, bankrupt. Um, so uh, people who have more money are more relaxed about that. And so very often they have more savings so that they don't need to take out a loan. So this is how you need to unburden people. You have to tell them, we can do this without you having to be liable yourself for the loan that is needed. 
The question of certainty, I think it's, it's key to the conversation that we are having because it affects both long-term investment, as you were saying right now, but it also affects the daily lives of people who decide to take such a huge risk. How can the Commission contribute to make sure that this is more or less stable across member states because this creates inequalities within Europe as well? Absolutely. So what we need to demonstrate to the member states are the benefits. You know, it's, it, it's uh, ultimately that convinces more than anything else. So just make uh, a calculation and say, oh, this is what you're paying now. This is your cost in terms of air pollution, which leads to premature deaths at a huge scale, and the bill is even higher. Uh, so if you go through this transition, it is an investment, but the bill, energy bill will be lower, your air quality will be better, uh, the uh, quality of, of living will be better, etc., etc. It's only got pluses, but we need to be able to demonstrate that to every single member state. Because in some member states, you don't even have to mention it. They know it. But we also have member states that are not there yet and that they fear that they cannot afford to be part of this transition. We need to demonstrate that they can. And we also have to be clear to everyone, this is also a matter of solidarity. Richer member states will have to carry a bit more burden than poorer member states, uh, etc., etc. So within societies, we need solidarity, but also between European societies, we need solidarity. Absolutely. I wanted to get back to Marcos and Emma. We've been having this conversation for a little while. Is there anything that you would like to contribute to this discussion with the, the Executive Vice President, a question, a question that you might like to ask? If you want to think about it, I can come back to the questions and then get back to you. No, básicamente que estamos de acuerdo. O sea, con lo que él... Basically, I would like to say that we agree. This is what the people is asking for, precisely. It is fundamental that the policy goes in the same line, and these 27 countries follow that same line. In the case of Spain, in 2015, we had a tax of the of uh, photovoltaic Eight. panels, and then in 2018, this law was uh, was re retired, was changed. So people. This creates distrust in people. Why am I going to invest if they're going to change the, the rules of the game in the, in, the, in the following years? So we need to, you to follow up in the promises that you are creating here right now. Explain uh, the things to people, especially older ones, because they maybe won't understand the importance of uh, climatization because they're not very concerned by it. So I think, yes, it's very important to uh, take the time to explain and to m maybe in some like offices or something like special for that how we and, can raise awareness and i also believe that that you know um small steps are small steps but if everyone takes a small step it's a huge step uh, for instance if we as i said before if we double our efforts to renovate buildings we decrease our gas consumption with huge amounts if we agree to lower a slight bit uh, the temperature in our houses. Uh, one degree, you save 10 billion cubic meters of, of gas. If you agree, for instance, like what they're doing in public buildings in Italy now, um, okay, we d will not uh, put air conditioning on uh, uh, below 25 degrees. Um, it has a huge, huge impact. Or if other choices you make, if, if you say, we'll eat a bit less meat, or we'll take the bicycle rather than the car, or we'll take the bus rather than the... It has immediate huge impact on our climate. And that gives people, I think, a good feeling, you know, because very often what I hear is, oh, I'm, such, I'm just one person, what can I do? Well, this you can do. And if we all do that, we really, really uh, contribute to, to the change. Individual personal choices are very important because it has an, a direct impact. But also, es ist wichtig, was Emma auch sagte, Bewusstsein schaffen, denn das führte doch zu einer Gesellschaft, die verlangte, dass es Änderungen gibt. Ja, absolut. Wir sprechen hier alle die Leute an und erwähnen sie, aber als wir die Gesetzgebung zum Plastik einführten, da sagten alle, hm, ich brauche doch hier meine Plastiktasse, meine Strohhalme. Had seen uh, David Attenborough's films, etc., and they educated their parents. And now we have this legislation in place. We no longer have plastic straws. Has the quality of our life been reduced? Not at all. But there's much less plastic in the ocean. So all these things, you know, are also a matter of changing mentalities and developing cultures. And and you know, we 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 have to learn not to use plastic bags. Uh, 
uh, one time. Uh, we have to learn to look for alternatives. And th the next step, I would say, is, for instance, textiles. Uh, if I look at young people, they are becoming extremely interested in, in secondhand textiles. And that's no longer something poor people do. No, it's cool, you know, to, to change with others and to, to trade. And, and, and te only 10% of our textiles today are recycled. We need to bring that up to 60, 70, 80 percent. And, and we can do this. It's just a change of mentality. And we had a proposal very recently from the European Commission on Textile. Yes. Um, going back to the question that worries a lot to the European citizens, when do you think the EU is going to be able to be fully independent in terms of oil and gas from Russia? Well, that's going to take a number of years. Um, it depends on whether, whether we are cut off. Then, of course, you have to, to look for alternatives. But normally, in our plans, we can reduce our gas consumption from Russia with one-third already this year. So one-third less, 50 BCM less this year. And then over the next couple of years, uh, President von der Leyen has said until 2027, we could be, reduce that uh, to nothing. Um, but it all depends on also how we make the energy transition happen. We also need to, to make sure we consume much less energy. We need to make sure we go much faster to... Uh, renewable uh, energy. And we also need to make sure we have contracts with other countries uh, for natural gas or LNG so that we diversify our energy resourcing. And at the same time, with those countries, we have to make strategic plans to, for them to be part of our hydrogen economy of the future because, you know, sticking forever to fossil fuels is not a good choice. So in that sense, doing all these things, we will increase Europe's sovereignty in the energy field and bring down energy prices and then also bring down the cost for our citizens. The question of pushing for more... Mm. Lo de la energía es esencial para la independencia. Tenemos a Italia, a Grecia y est estamos atrasados porque no hemos invertido lo suficiente los últimos años en los países que podían haber estado moviendo el poder en términos de energía renovable. As we could were so cheap and now the situation has completely changed and now you see everybody scrambling to get as much renewable energy as they can and now we have other bottlenecks can we produce enough solar panels can we produce enough winter but do we have enough people who can build these things do we have enough young people you know what what i find almost unacceptable i, I find it one of the worst situations in europe that you still have high levels of youth unemployment especially in mediterranean europe and at the same time, you, you have enormous shortages of workforce across the European Union. And we're talking about uh, changing uh, the policy with legal migration because we need people from else. I think it's just unacceptable that we still have so many unemployed. And why are they unemployed? Not because there are no jobs. It's because they don't have the right skills. So we need to make sure we give young people the opportunity to acquire the skills that will allow them to be productive in this economy. And, I mean, it's... Being productive in the, uh, in the renewable energy field, it will take you perhaps one, two, maximum three years of learning skills to be able to have a very good job in that, in that sector. Yeah, the skills shortage is also one of the key uh, challenges when it comes to the transition. Now, one of the inequalities we haven't talked about yet, but uh, has been raised by the uh, audience, is between the rural and yes. the uh, and areas in the cities. And one of the things that were mentioned that we will be talking about afterwards is mobility. And it's a question that some people feel that they depend on their cars. They cannot give up on their cars. How can the EU contribute to make sure that this is no longer a need? First of all, some people will permanently depend on their cars, and we need to recognize that. So what can we do? We could make the cars uh, that do not have emissions or very low emissions more accessible to them. Already now, if you have an electric car, it's much cheaper to drive than a combustion engine car. But it's still more expensive to, to buy. In a couple of years, uh, electric cars will also be cheaper to buy. But then you will still be left with huge legacies of second and third hand cars that will be necessary in the rural areas, especially for people who can't afford uh, new cars. So what we need to do is to have a policy that takes out of the market the dirtiest cars first. So it's not just about replacing cars with emissions uh, by cars with zero emissions. It's also taking the dirtiest cars out so that you have reduced emissions by the um, remaining combustion engine cars. 
but I will not go to rural areas in Europe and tell them you need to take a bus or the train if it's not there and it's not going to be there tomorrow. People will have to sometimes depend on their cars. We have to make sure they have cars that are much cleaner, preferably electric, uh, but also uh, you know, hybrid or very low emission cars. You have been in charge of the Green Deal for the past two years and a half. Our audience is wondering if you have seen a shift in the citizens' perspective and in the politicians' perspective about the climate change, and if so, what kind of change? Well, first of all, I've seen that the sense of urgency. I mean, look around us, the wildfires, the, the droughts in Spain, that are the desertification of parts of Spain. Look at the, you, the crops you could traditionally uh, cultivate in the south of France, you can no longer cultivate. Look at our forests in what state they are. Look at tornadoes in the Czech Republic. I mean, people are awake. They see that climate crisis is already upon us, and they know that if we don't change our ways, it get, will get completely out of control. That's the first thing. That was not the case uh, three years ago. People are now very much more aware. Uh, secondly, the energy crisis has also driven the change, and people are saying, okay, I understand. I need to have cheaper energy, and there has to be... Uh, renewable energy. Thirdly, you know, it's also um, a, a matter of education. People are educated by their kids, and their kids with the Fridays uh, for Future movement have really created a popular movement across the European Union that now transcends generations. That's also something different from uh, three years ago. And of course, today we are absolutely engulfed in this horrible, horrible war that's happening in Ukraine. So we don't talk about the climate crisis as much as we did before the war happened. But the climate crisis is still there. And both COVID and the war have increased the urgency of energy transition and Fit for 55 have not decreased it, but just increased. We need to move even faster than before. Do you think that there can be an opportunity to push for that transition? I think it is. Uh, another element that's important, all member states have given us their recovery plans uh, to recover after the COVID crisis. All of them have made a very big part of that transition. Uh, so refurbishing homes, uh, office buildings, uh, installing uh, electric charges along the uh, roads, uh, stimulating uh, uh, zero emission public transport, planting more trees. All of these things are now part of government policy with a lot of support with European money. Also, that's a good, good change. Absolutely. Um, to achieve a fair energy transition, would it be possible for the EU to provide affordable energy-saving technologies for low-income households? Yes, I think this can, especially if you organise that. You know, I, I'm from a country where we have a, a long tradition of, of public housing policy. Um, another country that uh, could be a good example for this is Austria. Um, there, you see collective buy-in. Of these, of these technologies. You see uh, a collective approach to the transition which lowers the administrative burden and also lowers the cost. Uh, because if you, if you could have much bigger contracts with people who make solar panels or insulation material or double or triple glazing, if you have bigger contracts, the price per unit goes down, obviously, and you also create long-term stability for the industry, which very often is small and medium-sized enterprises. And, and th this immediately creates jobs, not jobs in China, jobs here in the Euro European Union. So there are all sorts of benefits that are cumulative if we invest in that, if we do this collectively. Now, to put an end to this conversation, uh, during this time, we have been asking you, what is the EU doing? But if you would have to tell the citizens of the EU what can they do to contribute to accelerate this transition, what would you tell them? Well, again, in their personal choices, every small step made by more than 440 million Europeans together is a huge leap forward. And I hope people understand that they can do the right thing without compromising on the quality of their life. And they can, they can make the choices. And I think, you know, if I talk to mayors, especially mayors, local people, they want to help their citizens to do this. They want to be part of this transformation. So... I think what I would ask people is to trust themselves a bit more and to trust each other a bit more and to make sure that we leave no one behind. If we leave people behind, it's going to fail completely. But if we have a bit more trust in each other and we help each other and we make sure nobody is left behind, then we can succeed.
Absolutely. If you want to make your own pledge about what is it that you would like to do to contribute to the change, you can also go to the website of the Climate Pact, because there we are collecting pledges. So go and, st and tell us what, it, what are you doing to contribute to this transition. Thank you so much, Executive Vice President. Thank you Pleasure. so much, Emma and Marcos, for sharing your thoughts and your um, uh, ideas for this transition. We're going to stay and we will be back in a second to talk about food. We are going to be back in a second to talk about food sustainability. And for that, I am happy to welcome uh, Clara de la Torre, who is Deputy Director General at DG Clima, and Jean-Henriette Paquet, who is Director General for Research and Innovation. They will be joining me in the stage in a second. Uh, and that we are going to be joined as well by two of the citizens who participated in these peer parliaments and uh, citizens dialogue where they were talking about food sustainability. Food is one of the key elements of the EU Green Deal. We have to make sure that uh, we uh, consume in a more sustainable way uh, to protect our planet. So um, if they are ready, I would like to uh, welcome into the stage my speakers. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, now I would like to welcome the two citizens who are going to be contributing to the conversation today. The, uh, hey. Maria Giulia, who is Climate Pact Ambassador from Italy, and Miroslav, who is a citizen hey. voice, is a spokesperson okay. from Croatia. Now, before we start, Clara, why is it so important to put food at the core of the climate action? Good morning to all of you, and thank you for being in this in this participatory uh, uh, dialogues that we are having in the context of the of the conference for the future of Europe and also of the climate pact. So I'm really grateful for those that are following us here and those that have participated to all the input and of course our colleagues here. Why is it so important? Because what we eat, what we buy, um, as individuals and, and as households, does make a difference in the system. We are all used, we all know that fossil fuels um, are harming uh, our planet and this, is, this remains true, of course, but we have to realize that other parts of our consumption patterns, of how we live, where do we buy the things, where are they, um, how are they prepared, this is very important also for, uh, for, uh, for addressing climate change. To have a, 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 I will not give many figures, but let us, a couple of them which show the, the magnitude of the affair. 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the household's consumptions. Let us compare that with roughly 21% of the emissions that come from the, from the manufacturing sector and 22% roughly that come from the production of electricity and, uh, and uh, gas and steam. So let, uh, let us realize the importance of the magnitude of the, of the effort. We know that there is no magic solution, there is no single solution, all these are complex systems, the same as for transport we're discussing later, with the same as uh, we've heard our executive vice president. So it's complex, but there, is, there are solutions already there. And the important thing is that all of us together, we push in the same, uh, in the same, uh, in the same direction and we try to, to, identify, to identify them. Let us remember that our individual choices do have also an impact on the global system of, the, of, of, uh, of food. Um, the food system releases a third of the greenhouse gas emissions. A third. It's a lot. Um, and the food system consumes a huge amount of natural resources. Water. They can harm the soil. Um, so our... They can have, of course, negative effects on our own personal health with consequences for the, for the society. And let us not forget an important thing. We need a sustainable food system, healthy for the society, but also that rewards the producers of this food. 
this is as important as the rest. So the balance between sustainability and rewarding the producers is, uh, the producers is very important. Each of us in the union, we're here as, as part of policymakers, we are very committed to making these changes and finding the solutions. We can't do that without the member states. And we can't do that without you, the consumers, not only via your behaviors, but also via your votes when there are <laughs> elections. So um, there is a, there, this is a very important sector, just to, to close my, in my, my introductory remarks, very important sector in our everyday life, but also very, very, very important for our economy and for our planet. So let us make something about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. And indeed, you highlighted it's not only about individual choices, it's about policies. And that's what we're going to be talking about. I would like to hear first from Maria Giulia. I would like to know how was your deliberation and what are the conclusions that you reach uh, when discussing food sustainability? First of all, thank you for this important invitation. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Maria Giulia Fiore. I'm a molecular anthropologist and a teacher of science and mathematics. I'm Italian, but I'm coming here as a European citizen and as a spokesperson of a topic I really have at heart, the production and consumption of sustainable food. And I will just show you the results straight away. The peer parliaments in Europe so has... Um, participants ranging from 10 to 60 years old. According to the peer parliament, the more convincing options to allow for European citizens to eat in a more sustainable way and thus reduce food waste is to transform radically agriculture and um, the animal breeding by re reducing organic um, um, uh, consumptions. We need to, to eat less, um, less meat to eat more vegetables. We need to uh, buy more certificate food. The uh, suggestions included introductions of uh, subventions uh, for um, the agricultural sister and the reductions on VAT of non-animal uh, products. There was also the production of different other uh, rules, like uh, the strengthening of the market of certifications by banning pesticides. In general, we can identify five categories. So that is um, monetary incentives, education, rules and voluntary measures by the citizens and also by uh, the big industry. Particular attention was given also to the introductions of packages which can be uh, reused and of ecological labels. Well, I, I had three peer parliaments, one on sustainable food, and we had the children as participants uh, from 10 to 15 years old children together with their L, uh, parents. I thought that addressing uh, this, the, the younger uh, citizens was also um, a, a way to influence uh, their parents uh, and the elderly citizens. The um, atmosphere was very exciting because small children really want to provide their solutions because today, thanks to internet, uh, the uh, knowledge of certain topic is available for everyone. And uh, the new generations are very empathic. They have a, civ a civic uh, sense. They know that what is sustainable, that they know to buy local and sustainable food. And in, in particular, we noticed that the young children have uh, uh, an interest also for the well-being of animal inten in intensive uh, uh, production and how the consumption of uh, meat uh, has a negative impact on the planet. And they also gave us, provided with creative alternatives and also ecological alternatives. And that requires a change of mindset through uh, awareness campaigns uh, with advertisements, uh, uh, videos, uh, digital communication, events uh, in the streets, and also events in the schools where the children are uh, the main actors. They are talking to the adults. And then... Um, 
we uh, need to make children and uh, young people to put the, at the heart of these changes and uh, implement uh, formats like the peer parliaments. In the food productions, there's something wrong. As you were saying beforehand, breed, intensive breeding and intensive agri uh, agriculture uh, use a 7% of uh, um, clean water in, in, in the world, producing one third of greenhouse emissions. So we cannot teach anything to the children if we as adults make the wrong choices. So empathy and empathic growth is the key if we want uh, to, uh, the, the key for the young generations. And the empathy starts in the dish. The citizen is what it produces and it has to go from the mind to uh, the um, the plate and this can change through the rediscovery of local produce and seasonal produce the extreme exploitation of resources not only damage the economy which should have instead supported but also us, our consciences, our minds are on a sustainable burn because we are consuming cruelty. And uh, this cruelty uh, um, is a danger for uh, the planet and for our health. The children taught us that the present, not only the future, has to be green, has to be start in our kitchens and in our minds. Same ideas. Two things at the core. Let's change the mentality. So we need to raise awareness. But let's also give uh, um, uh, in a way to, uh, to make it easier economically, uh, this issue of maybe reducing VAT. How can the EU contribute to that change? Well, thank you very much. Uh, this was really uh, a rather remarkable um, uh, overview of a highly complex issue. And I think uh, the, the assemblies uh, and the work with younger people, you really have covered the ground of a systemic challenge. Huh? So, I mean, the first thing to say is that the analysis, I think we, we, can, we can share it uh, entirely. Uh, the drivers of change are indeed um, uh, what we need to focus on. And uh, the suggestions made, I think, are all uh, really, really um, interesting and relevant. And let me maybe um, react to some of them uh, and, and maybe then um, make a few additional suggestions. I think we, we indeed uh, have at EU level uh, this framework, which was described by Clara, of, uh, of, of changing the way we look at food from production, farm, to consumption fork, so the farm to fork strategy. You worked through it in, in, with, with, with all, with all your, your partners in the exercise. And I think if we start uh, on, the, on the farm side, um, I think the suggestions of better targeting uh, subsidies, uh, I mean largely under the European Common Agricultural Policy, to promote more sustainable uh, production pattern, agroecology, for example, um, a more limited use of pesticides, also ensuring that our farmers are... are are working on, on their land uh, for production, but at the same time also invest in biodiversity. Uh, often, as I think you implied, there are synergies uh, between the two, positive synergies between the two. All this, I think, is uh, absolutely relevant um, and uh, also, to a large extent, part of today's European um, uh, common agricultural policy. Admittedly, uh, the common agricultural policy is the result of a compromise between ministers, members of parliament, uh, on the basis of a, com of a commission proposal. And uh, certainly, um, this framework, which delivers partly what you are recommending, uh, can certainly be um, an implementation at national level, because there's a lot of space also for each member state to use that European framework and then target it even more ambitiously on promoting these changes of uh, production patterns, uh, including uh, using uh, less, um, less pesticides. I, I just can't resist, and, and, and you can see it here on my, on my little uh, piece of paper. Uh, we have also launched a mission, I don't know if this was discussed, a mission on, on European soils to restore the quality of our soils. I mean, of course, focusing particularly on agricultural land, but also uh, the issue um, of climate uh, adaptation certainly also covers the way we use soil in our cities. But for agriculture, uh, we will uh, aim at having 100 communities which will test uh, new ways of, uh, of farming uh, and I think it, it, entirely along the lines which you recommend, uh, because with that they would also see a restoration of the quality of their soil. So there's quite a lot happening, which really is, uh, I think, uh, it, largely in line 
uh, with what uh, you, uh, your group of citizens, including younger people, are recommending. Of course, the cursor can be more or less ambitious, and this is a very much an issue of uh, change management. I think there's one dimension which you didn't cover, and then I will move to consumption, which is that I think we also need uh, to find um, uh, ways, and the mission on soils does that to an extent, where we work with uh, farmers, consumers, uh, and NGOs uh, in, in a territorial concept uh, to help that transformation of production pattern happen in a faster way. Now, if I move to, 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 to the distribution and then consumption, I think, uh, indeed, um, certification schemes are key, uh, and uh, they are uh, also uh, existing, as, of course, you, as, as you said. Uh, in, in they exist at EU level with the framework. They have also different um, implementations uh, across our EU member states. It's not an easy exercise, huh? because uh, if you take one uh, label which is very prominent in Europe, with which the A, B, C, D, uh, quality of food for your health uh, label, this doesn't work necessarily for all uh, gastronomical or, or, or food consumption uh, cultures across Europe and is, uh, is therefore sometimes also challenged. But we need to move towards that and in particular also have um, much better standards uh, related to what is uh, used in agriculture and then ends up in what we eat. And pesticides are obviously what is on your mind. It's very much on my mind as well. Uh, I have uh, my, my father-in-law was farmer in France and um, he, he passed away young from cancer. And for me, there's no doubt that there's an immediate correlation between his agricultural practices with pesticides and uh, the illness which, um, which took him away. So that's certainly a key dimension. And here again, uh, there's a very ambitious framework at EU level. And, and, and certainly citizens need to continue to push us to be even more ambitious on the standard and its implementation thereafter. Now on... on, on on changing of the, what we eat, I mean, this is, I think, really at the, at the heart of it. Uh, and you're very right to, to say that uh, consumers will, by their consumption patterns, change the way um, we eat. Uh, and uh, drawing in young people, I mean, this, this is an amazing project uh, because you're absolutely right. I can see it with my 16-year-old daughter. I mean, she is extremely demanding on us uh, as to what we cook uh, and taking into account, indeed, uh, animal welfare, sustainability patterns, and um, uh, with uh, younger generations working on communication and, ha and, and, and not aiming at getting them to the right place in terms of, of sustainability, because they are, as you say, largely there already, but with them bringing us all to that better place, I think is really very, very smart. And I think we should really take this uh, up and see whether we can do more in terms of communication, uh, drawing on, uh, on the... Uh, on the expectations, emotions, uh, and, uh, and, and impact which, which our kids have on all of us, uh, and rightly so. Let me finish with one last point, uh, because I think you want to come in as well, Clara, and I don't want to be too long, uh, is um, that you, I don't think you covered science per se, uh, and of course I'm Director General for Research and Innovation, so if I don't say one word at least on science, uh, my teams uh, will be unhappy, and rightly so. Um, there's also one dimension where, where I believe uh, deeply that we need to do more, which is um, in terms of plants and the type of plants which become available for agriculture. I think we, we will, uh, as we move forward, and the Ukraine crisis uh, is impacting food poverty, not so much yet in Europe, even if I think we should not underestimate the impact on prices, but in the world. What is not produced in Ukraine and Russia cannot be compensated entirely in the European Union or, or beyond, and it will have a massive impact on food safety uh, in the world. Uh, and therefore, I think we need to continue also to invest into, into bringing uh, forward plants which resist better to hydric stress, less than the, you, you mentioned water rightly, uh, plants which um, can also uh, develop with less or maybe no pesticides, plants which can find um, uh, fertilizers in the atmosphere, not necessarily with uh, uh, chemical fertilizers added. All this requires um, that we look at the, uh, at, the, at the way the plant is constructed, and that is not GMOs, but that is nevertheless genetic engineering. Um, CRISPR-Cas is the technology which is available today. And I think what I very much hope to see is that we can discuss with citizens on that, because many parts of European society are very concerned with uh, modifying uh, living organisms, including plants, and they have 
reasons for that. But I also would argue that if we look at modifications which are carried precisely by the needs of agriculture as you express them, less water use, less pesticides, then I think we, we, we could, I hope, find a consensus on developing these plants which will hopefully be able to make a difference. But I think your, your, the work done is really very remarkable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeanne Henrique, for that contribution, that overview of all the many things that we absolutely need to do to improve uh, the sustainability of food. Before I turn to Clara, I would like to hear from Miroslav and his uh, discussion about food sustainability as well. So if you don't understand Croatian, I'm yeah, going to maybe help you. Then I need my mic. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'm, yes, I'm absolutely. absolutely. I'm reaching my limits. We're in the EU. <laughs> we have interpretation. <laughs> so everyone that doesn't understand <laughs> Croatian is going to be able to do so. Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Paquet, Mrs. Delatore. My name is Miroslav uh, and I come from Croatia. Each region of Europe is proud of its local food and regional products. Almost 900 citizens in 27 countries agree. We want that local food production is supported and promoted. We believe that a transition towards more sustainable food systems should rely on five pillars without any particular order. So support for local production and distribution, then a clear definition and regulation of the concept of sustainability. Third, awareness raising campaigns and education. Fourth, minimizing food waste. Fifth, investment and subsidies both for producers and consumers uh, and new technologies. When it comes to support for local food production and distribution, we believe that the accessing local food should not be a privilege for the few, for the richest ones. We propose a few adjustments and more regulations. Supermarkets should mandatorily have shelves dedicated to local food yeah. and we should have less uh, administrative uh, bureaucratic barriers that prevent small local producers from engaging in the market. Our panels suggest encouraging small farmers to form cooperatives for improved market access. Stop. The consumers should, be, uh, should have an easier access uh, to direct producer to consumer sales. Local farmers markets should be supported, keeping in mind uh, the opening times and align them with office hours. Online platforms should also play a more prominent role in distribution. Generally, import and export from other regions of the world should be reduced as much as possible. I am lucky to live in an area where I can access food straight from producers, but it's not the case for all Europeans. We citizens want to increase opportunities for urban farming and community gardens, particularly in schools or urban areas where green space is limited. It's time we return to producing and consuming local food. This means that we are ready to eat more seasonal and less imported foods. Let's do this in order to stimulate the local economy, increase food security, and ultimately be more sustainable. But what exactly means uh, the expression sustainable food system? It, we are quite often uh, in doubt and uh, marketers often use this word with misleading intentions to sell at a higher price. We would like to have guidance and regulation coming from the European Union. Let me introduce to you two ideas we came up with. The first one is that we would like to have more transparent and standardized labeling of the origin of the products. This labeling should focus on nutrition, environmental impact, country of origin, to be simple and intuitive, but also complete. The second one is that we suggest financial penalties or quotas for food produced and distributed in unsustainable ways. For example, imported products that could be instead produced locally and be seasonal. A third important topic that we discussed at all panels across Europe was the need for more awareness raising campaigns and education on sustainability. We need various people to show us and teach us on sustainability, such as experts, school teachers, but also influencers, chefs, farmers. We'll have lost contact with nature, maybe not we, but our younger generation have. 
and the younger generations don't know where food comes from. Schools should be the first place where they learn about sustainability as a holistic concept across the food system, including topics such as healthy eating, waste recycling, sustainable food production, and of course, water management. The fourth point, what to do with food waste and packaging. While it is important to have less packaging for food, this is not nearly enough to compensate for all the waste produced. It is everyone's responsibility to minimize food waste, from those who produce food to supermarkets to us consumers. These are some of our suggestions. We need more widespread control and a more realistic approach to the best buy date with high discounts on near to expire food. We suggest normalizing the, the so-called ugly food that usually would not be bought or sold. Stop, stop. We would welcome the uh, apps uh, for an increased availability of food, such as Too Good To Go, also in rural and semi-urban areas. We also propose to review current bureaucratic barriers to food waste distribution to, for example, food banks. Final point, the director and deputy director general, but certainly not least, let's not forget when it comes to food system sustainability, money is a key issue. Unfortunately, the transition to more sustainable food systems will depend significantly on available funding, subsidies, and investments for production and consumption. Those with the most limited resources, citizens who have trouble making ends meet, small producers on their knees because of bad harvests due to the ever-increasing extreme weather should not be left behind. Because we all will feel it. Thank you. Um, we, we have heard again about the need for education, raising awareness, uh, economic incentives, but also about food waste, which is something that we hadn't touched before. Clara, how do you feel about these initiatives that you hear from citizens? These are fantastic initiatives. Uh, as I was saying, food waste is a very important one, and we have to see what's the responsibility of each of us as consumers, but also of the food industry. And we have published a, a, um, a code of conduct uh, for food industry precisely to address a number of things, among which is the, is the, is the food waste. And we are preparing a broader framework for the, food, uh, for the food sector at the end of next year, hopefully, where many of the issues you, are, you, are, you have uh, mentioned will be addressed. We already have uh, information, we have initiatives and, and, and regulations on the food labeling. This is very important. Uh, and we have to make this, um, let us say, understandable and transparent to the citizens. And both of you were referring to the children and to the young people. These are the citizens of the future, the decision makers of the future, and it's absolutely crucial that they are brought in. And in many cases, they are brought in, but in many others, their families, their surroundings cannot afford that education. So we have to make sure that, that this happens. There is also something that has been mentioned indirectly, which is uh, biodiversity loss. If we do not have proper food systems, and for other reasons as well, we are suffering a huge biodiversity loss. And biodiversity loss means more uh, influence, more devastating climate, uh, climate change effects, uh, worse health, um, uh, think of the, the health outbreaks that we are having. So all these different elements, that's the, comp the charm and the complication of the affair. There are many different uh, dimensions, many different stakeholders, an important economic legitimate interest, and I would like to come to the point of uh, Jean-Éric. We are blessed with one thing in climate change, in biodiversity, is that we have solid scientific uh, foundations of the policy. Very solid. And technology and innovation does have a huge amount of replies to, or solutions to, this, to these problems. And um, these ones, together with the legislation that we know, you know that we try, and sometimes we are criticized for that, but it's absolutely necessary. And together with the change of behaviors that both of you were referring at, this compendium of these three things are important. Of course, there is one thing that you're both mentioning as well, which is 
investment. And investment, this is why we've done the famous so-called taxonomy. This is why we want to be us, we make the, the, the corporations to report on non-financial issues so that all the actors of the economic system do know where we are investing and where we are going. Thank you so much for that. Now we're going to turn to our audience because we are getting questions from them. And one of the issues that worries them a lot is the issue of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. And they were wondering whether the EU could actually come up with labeling to make sure that they tell the real story about that kind of food. Yes, I mean, we, we, this, this came uh, indeed um, uh, already earlier uh, from Maria. Uh, we, we absolutely need to um, continue to work on our labelling uh, system. Um, as I uh, indicated, uh, labelling systems are, are challenging to, to develop because they need at EU level to be relevant for 27 different uh, food cultures. I mean, the way you look at food in Croatia is certainly not the way we look at food in Denmark or, or Norway. And the Italian cuisine, uh, probably the best in Europe, uh, also has a, a number of ingredients which are very difficult to classify as um, I immediately um, uh, healthy when in reality they are. So this has... Um, has been, uh, uh, I think, a particularly uh, challenging uh, area of uh, regulation and standard setting. But I completely agree uh, with, with, with what um, uh, citizens are thinking. I, 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 that's my view as well. Uh, we need to bring it uh, to, to, to a level where it uh, really can make a difference. And I think there is indeed here the dimension, the local dimension, yourself, which you described extremely well. And I think um, there is always, of course, uh, the need to have an EU-level uh, standard and, and certification, because we also want to ensure that uh, such a certification can uh, support citizens and protect consumers everywhere, including in, in the context where a lot of, uh, of food is made available across the internal market, which is, I think... Uh, an amazing uh, benefit of the last two decades uh, in terms of food quality and diversity for all of us as consumers. So that is needed with a challenge which I uh, tried to describe. But I think that at the same time, uh, we certainly also need to have a good local labelling, the one which you described, huh? uh, get, reassuring us that what we, the, the, the apple which is there is indeed not coming from 2000 or 20,000 kilometers away, but coming from an orchard um, next door. Huh? Uh, and that, I think, um, uh, is certainly something which can be dealt with at local level. Uh, it can maybe be also um, uh, promoted in terms of, uh, of voluntary standards at regional or national level, and certainly facilitated by European policy, but can also be done in, 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 in complement with what we need to do at EU level. So it makes a lot of sense. We have seen a lot of initiatives of good experiences uh, exchanging exactly. between different member states, right? Yeah. Uh, Clara, one of the issues that have been raised both by Maria Giulia and Miroslav, but also by our audience, is the question of raising awareness. How can the EU, the EU contribute to that, to raise awareness, to make sure that people understand how they can actually consume food in a sustainable way? This is a very complicated issue because from Brussels, as we are called, it's very difficult to reach to all the citizens. We do our efforts. We work in networks with the governments, with networks of, uh, of uh, non-governmental organizations. And we have, under the Climate Pact, we have um, information which is available in an understandable way for citizens. We have also prepared uh, um, um, kits of, uh, of tools for educators to use. To, they are ready-made in all languages to be they use. And we have uh, the initiative of the climate ambassadors under the pact. We have nearly 1,000 because we don't have time to process all of them. And they, they are precisely persons who are credible interlocutors. They are not those ones that are going, coming to say the lesson. They are those that know the field, know their area, know the concerns, the different values, as uh, jean luc was mentioning, in gastronomy, in everything. We, in, in, in Europe, strength is diversity, and that's the complication. And then things are not perceived equally everywhere. So the, the, the ambassadors of the pact are a very good tool, but as I say, we have plenty of other initiatives. 
But we need you all because getting to the citizens from Brussels, it's very complicated. And we will tell you later how you can actually contribute and be present as well and be part of the solution. Jean-Éric, uh, some of the issues that have been mentioned as well, uh, it's something that you talked about before and it's a question of GMOs. Um, and the audience is asking whether this is something that could publicly be in this cast, considering that so many citizens have such a strong opinion about it. I think it should. I think it should. I, I mean, of course, it is, but it's a discussion which is not very visible. And arguably, I think this is not a discussion which uh, should take place... Um, uh, I mean, it needs to take place uh, around regulatory development as a generic discussion. But I think what would be much more powerful would be to have uh, debates between uh, uh, a scientist, a team of scientists, working on uh, plant gene editing and citizens and not just for the scientists to explain to the citizen that this is harmless, uh, but that the discussion is uh, between, between citizens uh, and, in an organised manner and that group of scientists on what uh, characteristics of the plant do we want. So that the choice made by the scientist is co-created to an extent, and, and to a large extent hopefully, with citizens. So that we don't produce a plant which is then great to sell one fertiliser, but we produce a plant which doesn't need a pesticide. Or we produce a plant which, in that local context, is resisting to a specific pest. And I think if this is the discussion, and if the scientific choice at the outset is made with citizens, the discussion then, I think, changes. I mean, obviously, uh, this is uh, uh, making sense, uh, uh, I think, as I present it. But the real challenge, I think, would then be to be able to credibly... Uh, say or demonstrate or, or, or show that the choice was indeed made in this participatory way. Uh, and I think that's really the challenge of communication. Uh, um, but uh, having a broader discussion on plant gene editing, which is not modifying the organism, but modifying the... the, the, the it's, it doesn't modify the DNA, but it, 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 well, it, it engineers the DNA. So it's not so... Straightforward to uh, argue that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete difference, but there is a real scientific difference. Uh, and there is, a, with that scientific difference, the main risk of pro proliferation, which was at the heart of the GMO debate, is completely different in terms of scope and, and risk. So it's a real different technology. But it nevertheless remains so that it needs to be explained as a technology. And then the choices with that, that technology, if it can be made with citizens and it, this is, becomes known, it will be a game changer, I would say. Honestly, seeing that we have a trend in the past few years questioning science, I think it would be a great initiative from the Commission to try to create this forum where they bring together citizens and scientists to make sure that they are well informed. I was wondering, Maria Julia Miroslav, is there something that you would like to ask or to comment on the conversation that we're having about food? I would like to say uh, innovations, new technologies. I am in contact uh, with uh, people who are working on some minerals uh, with uh, silici and everything. But they, don't need, they need money to improve this new technology in uh, our agriculture system. Also in uh, farms to low down metal, methane and everything else. They need some new money. How can they contribute to, with funding to those initiatives? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think um, we, this is the, what we are now discussing, uh, overhauling and changing our, our consumption pattern and our production uh, systems will also require, indeed, uh, changes in technology. And innovation, I think, can be uh, very powerful from that point of view. And you see it in many aspects. I was recently in, in Spain, uh, where a pri an innovation prize was handed over to um, uh, young girls, 15, 16 years old, uh, for an innovation which they had created. The innovation was indeed about food waste, uh, ensuring that there is an IT system which allows all restaurants in their town to make available the, the cooking oil and a number of other waste uh, produced in the restaurant in a timely manner so it, that it can be properly processed and recycled. So, I mean, pretty straightforward, but it wasn't done yet. Uh, uh, and that's, I think, a, a nice a small bottom-up example. But then there are indeed innovations which really re require also significant funding to scale up. Uh, and I think in Europe we have a lot of funding available, uh, in, in notably, I mean, on science to begin with, but also on, on the innovation which you are describing. 
You have uh, funding for startups everywhere in Europe, in all member states, all regions are now doing it. We are creating in Europe more startups than anyone else in the world. Huh? So it's not for lack of support. Huh? It's sometimes a, uh, the issue is to find the support systems and the innovators and that they come together. And at EU level, we also have a number of instruments to once the, the product or the service is, is, is really... Uh, stabilizing that we can help scale it up with the European Innovation Council. So yes, uh, innovation is traditionally seen as uh, you innovate to make a lot of money. Well, I think in Europe we innovate to provide solutions to society much more than anyone else. And, and in the area of agriculture, food, we'll come to transport in a moment, I think innovators hold a big, big part of the solution. One second, Beatrice. Yeah, the common ahead. agricultural policy, where we know that the European Union invests a lot, there, there are eco-schemes precisely to facilitate the take-up of, uh, of uh, innovative uh, uh, technologies, innovative uh, business processes. So go and look at the community agricultural policy. There is a lot of money there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Maria Julia, is there something that you would like <clears throat> to share, to ask? Sì, che credo che le competenze digitali Yes, I think that IT uh, are, is fundamental. Uh, um, we really have to insist on it uh, from the beginning at school. Now, uh, Internet is everywhere, so we have to take advantage of it. Now, even uh, older people can use the Internet, so let's focus on it, let's try to communicate through the internet because it is vital to inform everybody. Thank you. So one minute event, though, we run out of time because I think it was an important question that we had from our audience is that something that Miroslav also highlighted and is the fact that sometimes uh, biofood is hard to access for some low-income households. How can they use support uh, the access to more sustainable food for low-income households? This is, this is um, as I think the executive vice president was saying before, some of the things with, with an eco label are just made more expensive because uh, we have also to think because um, cert the, food that, the food systems that we, need to, that we need to design need to be healthy, affordable, nutritional and sustainable. And, and it's only by looking at all these things at the same time that we will get there. If we look at only at one aspect of the issue, we'll never get there. But there is no reason by natural law that these better uh, products for food need to be absolutely more expensive. But the agricultures and the farmers need to be rewarded for their work as well. Let me maybe add something here, including echoing, uh, Mary, what you said. Huh? Uh, I mean, there are experiences which, which I can see, um, I mean, here in Belgium, I've seen some in France as well, uh, where um, the challenge, I think, of, uh, of the cost of food and the quality of food is also that uh, in, in, in all parts of the population, maybe a, a bit more visibly in the lower income part of the population, we use a lot of processed food which are in fact quite expensive. Huh? They look cheap, but they're in fact quite expensive. And there are experiences huh, carried by citizens, and this has nothing to do with the Commission, uh, where uh, you have in, 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 in a neighbourhood, um, you, you, you learn again to buy not processed food but natural food, and you learn to cook again. And it's much cheaper, and without having to necessarily use bioproducts, which could be indeed sometimes out, uh, overpriced, but just normal uh, non-processed food, can at the same time provide more healthy food and also deals to an extent at least with the cost of food. But of course it requires uh, to cook again and to, um, and to invest your time into that, which is a challenge for everyone. The importance of education, especially from Chef, as Miroslav was talking about before. Yes. Thank you so much, Maria Julia. Thank you so much, Miroslav, for your contribution. To Clara and Jean-Eric, who stay with me. But thank, thank you, you so much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Yeah. 
We are back and now we're going to be talking about mobility, which is also one of the key elements of the, um, of the discussion when it comes to a more sustainable uh, transition, to a more green transition. And for that, I am going to welcome uh, our two citizens who are going to be sharing their experience in the discussions, uh, who are Annika, who is Climate Pact Ambassador from Germany, and Janis, who is Citizens Voices, a spokesperson from Latvia. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we start the conversation, um, I would like to turn to jan -Henrique. Why so important to talk about mobility and why so important to bring citizens into that conversation when we talk about the green transition? Uh, well, I mean, this is, a, of course, a, a subject at the, at the heart of the challenge, huh, which we, I think, still need to, the nut which we still need to crack. Uh, mobility is probably one of the most challenging areas to abate. Uh, I mean, Clara has a long uh, history in transport, and I do as well. I've been 15 years in transport policy before moving to research. Um, we have, uh, over time, been able to start to decouple uh, CO2 emissions from, uh, from, from transport growth, but only to a limited extent. And we have here uh, the, 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 the double challenge that everybody uh, craves mobility. We want to be mobile as uh, human beings. And uh, our economy um, and also a number of societal developments require uh, mobility and fluid mobility. And to an extent, the European project is about allowing us to, to come together. And, 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 and the challenge is that um, technology is going to be key, but technology brings us only so far. Uh, we will not only with technology be able to um, deploy uh, transport systems, uh, which effectively are, are low carbon and zero carbon. So we need also as society to look at our mobility patterns, uh, both in the economy and um, uh, as uh, individuals, and, uh, and accept that they will need to, uh, to be different in 10, 20 years' time than they are today. But that cannot be done uh, uh, top-down. That can only be done by us as citizens. And we need to decide what type of city we want to live in, we need to decide um, uh, where, how far and uh, how often and with which means of transport we want uh, to go on holiday. Uh, we need to decide, uh, and that brings us back to the previous discussion on, on local production patterns, um, how we want our economy to operate and find possibly a, a greater um, input from local productions, which would also in turn uh, minimise transport. Technology uh, will go a long way, and at European level we are investing in clean aviation, for example, which looks so difficult to abate, but there is now real research ongoing for hydrogen planes um, or electric planes, which of course then will create um, in turn pressure on energy systems and renewable energy, so it's not a silver bullet, but in the a process leading us to 2050, obviously very important. Uh, electric mobility from uh, individual electric mobility to cars is certainly also um, uh, projected to, to provide a, a lot, a lot of improvement as we move forward. But transport is part of a system, a, a human system, an economic system, and therefore needs to be looked at in this very uh, challenging or, or, or at least systemic um, interactions. And I finish by saying that from the previous discussion, uh, it's very obvious that uh, as society we are increasingly and very broadly, I find, uh, seeing the need for change. And during the pandemic, uh, in the first lockdowns across Europe, we, we thought we were changing. And I'm thinking here both on mobility but also on, on food consumption. Uh, frankly, this has, has not really continued at scale um, uh, as we were exiting the pandemic. I don't think we should be... Uh, too upset about it, but we, we, I think, need to draw the lessons about it and really ensure that there are as many platforms as possible available across Europe uh, to ensure that um, citizens can reflect for themselves uh, onto uh, what mobility they need. Of course, then there will be also national and EU level uh, frameworks to facilitate deployment of solutions. But I think this is really one of the areas where citizens um, uh, are holding a big part of the key. Absolutely. I, I think it was very interesting that you mentioned that mobility is part of a wider system because one of the things we realized during the pandemic is that cities are uh, not built for people to live in them and that we need to see a transformation also in the urban development. But I know that both Annika and Janice have a lot of ideas about how we can actually transform. Uh, transport. Annika, why don't you tell us about your deliberations? Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, dear Mrs. De La Torre, dear Mr. Paquet, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the outcome of our peer parliaments. My name is Annika. I'm a manager. I'm a lawyer working as a, at a research and technology organization and a mother. Most of all, I'm deeply worried about our future and about the future of my children. At the same time, I re refuse to give up hope. I trust in you and in our politicians and in the human being itself that we will save the only one planet that we have. In summary, the most important results of our peer parliaments are as follows, both for short distance travel as well as for long distance journeys. The first is sustainable mobility must become cheaper and more convenient. The second, mobility infrastructure has to become upgraded or to be upgraded and better connected. So high frequency and safe travel must characterize it. In all peer parliament sessions that I hosted, there was a, a broad spectrum of people. There were t I, I did two on mobility. Um, so there were both skeptical people who tend to reject climate protection measures as well as climate activists. Some of them live in the city of Munich or nearby, some of them in the countryside. I'm proud to say that we managed to have fruitful and respectful discussions. For all the participants, however, one thing was very clear. Mobility as it exists at now at the moment has no future. Traffic jams and high gasoline prices are getting to people. And local and long distance public transportation is really unattractive and expensive. Even more, a lot of traffic causes noise and exhaust fumes lead to respiratory diseases and to bad air. The issue of mobility is therefore not only a climate issue, it's an issue of the general quality of life itself and our health in Europe. Let me tell you a story from one participant uh, who lives in a small town about 35 kilometers outside Munich. She can take a train to work, which runs 20 minutes, and it runs only one time per hour. Recently, the prices for this train raised a lot, and although gasoline prices are really rising now very sharply, she decided to drive to work from now on because she did a calculation and she found out she can no longer afford the train. And of course, the flexibility of the car is great for her. This shows directly the factors that uh, I already mentioned and that are decisive. So it's flexibility, comfort and prices. Another story of one parliament participant illustrates the results for the long distance journeys. His family will travel to Great Britain this summer and when he booked the train tickets from Munich via Paris to London, he found out um, that it will take 13 hours one way, so a whole day, and it will cost around about 1,000 euros just uh, for all the four of them. He had to buy the tickets on two platforms, so one for the trip to Paris and one then uh, going on to London, and he checked the flight prices just for comparison and found out that it would only cost 550 euros for the direct trip from Munich to London. Again, what, what will he do? He will go by train, but you only do this if he, you really want to, and if you have, of course, the, num the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was a climate activist person. Um, <laughs> now, this real life example shows again um, what citizens demanded in our peer parliaments flexibility, comfort, and better prices. A very good role models for this can already be found. In Austria, for example, they have a climate ticket, and in Switzerland. Dear Mrs. De La Torre, dear Mr. Paquet, with view to the urgency of tackling the climate crisis, I would like to present um, concrete proposals of two participants. The first is, start with taxation of kerosene quickly and invest the gained tax revenue in sustainable public transport. The second, enact regulations that promote a city toll and bus lanes in overcrowded cities. In, in Stockholm, for example, it works already. We need fast solutions with direct effect on CO2 emissions. Finally, you might know the Netflix movie Don't Look Up. It is about science denial and about climate change. If we want to give our future a better ending than in that movie, the issue of climate protection will have to get a much higher priority.
in our daily life. EU peer parliaments gave some Europeans the opportunity to raise their voices. But in my opinion, too few Europeans had the chance to take notice. If the EU Green Deal shall become a real success story, then it needs big public relations campaigns with solid funding so that no, no single European can walk along the street without noticing it. And if Europeans get to be heard by the EU, I'm really convinced of this, then the spirit of Europe can develop a new strength, a strength that we will need facing this biggest crisis of mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annika. That was a very powerful speech, Clara. How do you feel when you hear citizens so strongly advocating for more climate action? I, I can only join their, their wishes and their acts. And you can, you can be sure that in the European Commission, whether those of us working directly on climate, but those working on science, those working on, on, on mobility, uh, look for that. Um, let us remember, a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions come from transport. That's, it is clear that without doing something there, we will never become climate neutral. We need fewer cars on the road, indeed. We need cleaner cars on the road. We need to move. Why do we have a partnership that is called Shift to Rail? Or it used to be called Shift to Rail. Precisely, there is a lot of freight that could be more um, easily and more cheaply and more efficiently be transported by, by rail. You made a reference to the, to the, to the tax of kerosene. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, we agree with you. And this is why there is a proposal on the table to change precisely the energy directive to get rid of these exemptions. We ha have no economic rationale and certainly no climate rationale. Yes, we were saying we need cleaner cars. We need better tra public transport. All this needs money. There is investment, investment in the recovery plans, there is investment in research, but there is also a number of regulatory tools that are going to help us. Remember when we had the, 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 the previous CO2 standards, there was, there was a huge hassle in the industry saying, no, you're going to kill the industry. Not only we have not killed the industry, but the industry has shown that they are developing more and more uh, clean cars, whether electric of, or with hydrogen. We see that in the, even within the pandemic, the, the, the sales of uh, these clean cars, which is still very low, but still is growing very much. Citizens will tell us, have told us, yeah, but we, if I can't charge them, there's no point in having a car. Yes, we have put on the table, and they are absolutely right, there is a lot of money again in the recovery funds precisely for building up this infrastructure, and we have put on the table regulations so that by 2035, I think, 2025, I need to check my dates, 2025 we have one million recharging points, uh, either for electric or refueling for, uh, for, for hydrogen. So, as, as, as you were saying, Annika, the, all this has an effect on our everyday life. The time we waste transporting ourselves, the noise it produces, the bad air quality. And all this, solving all this, has a very good case for our lives, but also for business. There are new business models, sharing cars, uh, um, new ways of arranging. What you were explaining about the, the train tickets, I will not comment on it, but this is an old, an old, uh, an old problem that I can't see why we can't solve it. Um, we will have to do something about it. So I can only join you and you, and thank you for all these uh, uh, very concrete suggestions. She didn't comment on that, but you will have to, because our audience is very much concerned about the question of train tickets from yeah. one place to another. So I will bring back to, the, was, to this um, in the I conversation. Was, I was in the past director for, Euro director for European Rail Policy, and I could tell you why we are not there yet, and uh, it's a real big, big, big frustration um, that we are still uh, so far away. I mean, during the French presidency, I, of course, was able to travel only by train huh, for all events. Uh, even Marseille, well, it was six hours, but I think six hours well invested and you can, you can work on the train. There's a lot which you do on the train in reality, but it was indeed very expensive. Huh? There's okay. no doubt to be had on that. Huh? Uh, can, I, can I react to oh, the second ahead. proposal of, of Annika, uh, the, the, far, the bus lanes, huh? and, or, yeah. or the, the way uh, uh, the cities are designed? Huh? Uh, I think this is absolutely a critical topic. Uh, and you were saying that we need fast solutions. I think this is really also uh, important, um, uh, an important uh, uh, view uh, shared by citizens, which is, I think, the view of science. Huh? If you look at the latest um, uh, 
uh, in, uh, um, in intergovernmental uh, climate change panel at the IPCC report, I mean, time has run out, huh? as, we, as we know. Uh, and this really means that, of course, we need to look at 2050 because that, that's a, a, a relevant and necessary timeline to move to zero carbon uh, societies. But we absolutely need to be much more ambitious by 2030. I mean, Europe is, huh? uh, but we are the only ones with clear targets and policies in place. Uh, and that's the discussion of today. Huh? They, they, they can and need to be upgraded even further, but they, they will, I would argue, be there to get us to 55%. The challenge is to then, and our transport transformation, I think, will be very powerful from that point of view, is then to lead the rest of the world. Huh? I mean, lead is maybe a bit of a strong word, but I think we will be the benchmark for the rest of the world, the standard setter for the rest of the world. And if we get the transformation of now our, not systems, but transport industries, including then also um, the systems providers, uh, right, I mean, they will become amazingly efficient, competitive, and would, with that, hopefully, drive also transformations in the rest of the world. I'm thinking here of aviation, um, rail transport to an extent, um, uh, but aviation in, in particular. Now, to move to your bus lane, back to your bus lanes, um, I mean, this is obviously spot on. Huh? We all know uh, cities which have great um, uh, uh, mass urban transit systems, including on the road, huh? and others which are just a permanent traffic jam. Huh? Uh, we know both type of cities. And I think this is uh, an absolutely key investment, one which requires uh, uh, certainly courage for city administrations, but also city administrations which are ready to design it with their population. Huh? Otherwise, it's extraordinarily difficult to do. And, and I think Europe has, uh, has thousands of great examples uh, on which to build. And this brings me to uh, uh, the European mission on cities. I don't know if this was uh, made, this is something which you are aware of. Uh, Europe has launched a, a mission to profoundly change our cities and we have asked cities to make a pledge to become climate neutral, climate neutral huh, by 2030. Uh, admittedly, it was a bit of offsetting, huh, but still, climate neutral by 2030. Uh, and uh, we had 377 cities which applied and we now have selected 100 with which we will work to help them transform into a climate neutral city by 2030. I mean, this is a massive acceleration, and transport is, of course, at the heart of it. Energy systems, waste management, transport, housing, but transport very much. And I think that um, the city's mission will allow, on the one hand, to identify all the available solutions, transport management, transport technologies, which exist and which can be rolled out. We don't need so much more uh, in terms of, of, of new inventions. We need to roll out. But then the mission is very much based on designing these transformations with, with um, the population of the city. That's part of the methodology entirely. It's at the heart of it. And that's the only way to do it. And there are, uh, there are capitals like Athens, uh, Paris, Lisbon, which are there. And now I don't have the list of names in, in Germany completely on the top of my head, so I don't want to take risks and, and, and name a city which is not in there, because I think many could be there. But of course, we also had to make, cho make, make choices. But we have also, um, I, I think in Latvia, I think it's Riga, huh? if, uh, if my memory is correct. Uh, in Estonia, it's uh, um, uh, Tartu, for example. Uh, but we have cities uh, everywhere um, in the EU. And the interest is, on the one hand, that hopefully they will be able, with support uh, at EU and national level, to, to get there by 2030. But this is going to be an amazing example for all other cities. And I think for transport, I mean, now urban transport, which is the bulk of emissions, huh, um, uh, this can be quite a game-changer. And I think it's interesting because mobility shows the different layers of complexity that we have when we put together EU policy. You have the EU standards, but then you have the national strategies. Exactly. And then the way that it's translated is local and depends very exactly. much on how people behave in cities. So it's very important to have this kind of forum yeah. where you can bring everyone together. Today I came by bike. Just to, just to be on the safe side for the discussion. <laughs> Brilliant. I would like to bring now Janice into the conversation uh, to learn a little bit more about how was your citizen dialogue. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Director General, Deputy. My name is Janice. I come from Latvia. And I'm here today to discuss the topic of sustainable and smart mobility, which is a topic that actually touches us all in our daily lives. Whether we live in big cities or countryside, the choices that we make, the choices that actually are available to us, they profoundly impact the climate change. I would even state that many of us see that mobility itself and the re resulting consumption of fossil fuels 
is the number one contributor to the climate change. But actually, what is a smart and efficient mobility there? Is there a definition? How do you count this incredible diversity between different European countries, people who are living in rural areas with no access or minimal access to transportation, or people living in big cities with underground trains, pay-as-you-go, e-mobility options, etc.? It is clear from our deliberations that uh, we want to have a choice. We want smart and agile mobility that recognizes all of our needs. We want to have options, not ready-made templates that dictate our daily lives. The first taking problem that we face, actually, be it in the cities or the rural area, is the lack of infrastructure or aging infrastructure. There are considerable disparities in opportunities between countries. The European Union must support us, our countries, our regions, our cities, in building and renovating this infrastructure, cycleways, railways, waterways, charging stations, even park and ride stations for that last mile mobility. We, of course, also need financial support in order to purchase reduced or zero emission public transport vehicles. I myself live in Riga, capital of Latvia. I own a car, I own a bus card, I even walk, I even run if I'm late to some. Thing. In a way, I choose to move around using frequent public transport or by walking, cycling to many places. While well, several of our citizen panels supported the idea of so-called 15-minute cities, with all things in easy reach, not all Europeans have, have this kind of convenient access to the services that they need. So your financial support and uh, technical assistance will be needed to improve this public transport make it cheaper, more frequent, reliable, direct. In a word, more accessible. Many citizens in the panels also felt that there's a lack of proper planning by the authorities. A good example for is many buses running around half empty because of their poorly designed and already obsolete schedules. During these panels, we also learned a great deal from each other and other countries' experiences. Citizens proposed many good ideas, and we want to recommend introducing a national integrated ticket, as already seen in the Netherlands. Um, as we heard from the peer parliaments also, we discussed the smarter and more sustainable options for long-distance transport. We came across countries to an agreement that transport by train and potentially by water should also be enhanced and become more widespread. But for that to happen, we again, we need lower prices, better infrastructure, integrated ticketing and available information on how to use all that. Currently, only large cities are well connected. And this leaves many, possibly most Europeans actually, out of this opportunity. Changes in airline taxation will also be needed to make airline travel better reflect its actual external costs that they are. As you can maybe already hear the pervasive theme here, it's all about integration. In our panels, we also discussed individual mobility and the opportunities provided by car sharing, car pooling. We also talked about the rise of electric cars. Still, many of us are not convinced that the perceived benefits outweigh the costs and that electric vehicles are a good investment in the long run. We also believe that they are not necessarily very green, given that the batteries are difficult to produce and later recycle. We need more research and we need more development on this to make e-mobility a really viable option. Finally, I would like to point out a topic uh, that is not strictly related to the mobility, but significantly relates to it. During the pandemic, Europe experienced a large scale unprecedented scale of remote work. The resulting drop in emissions, traffic, pollution itself was so significant that it would be foolish not to be overlooked and in any strategy or in any effort to make this mobility smarter. The possibility for remote work will always provoke us to be mobile only as necessary 
instead of doing hours long, meaningless day-to-day -day commute. Director General, Deputy Director General, thank you for coming in and listening. I recognize that there is a lot of work yet to be done, and I am confident that the uh, European Commission will want to go that extra mile to make sustainable mobility happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Janis. I'm going to ask you both to think if there is something that you would like to ask Clara and Jean-Henrique. And in the meantime, I'm going to turn back to Jean-Henrique to have a reaction. Uh, one of the things that Janis mentioned was mm -hmm. this question of developing uh, in the cities and make sure that they are actually designed to have a proper mobility uh, uh, a system, but also this question of not being adapted to the way that people behave. Um, how can the EU contribute to helping member states, citizens, regions, to make sure that this is, this is happening? Uh, maybe a system like the one you were mentioning before this project. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks a lot. Uh, also very uh, remarkable um, insights and a very large um, systemic view uh, of the challenge uh, where indeed uh, I think uh, on your direct question I, I would come back to the uh, cities mission now, which I think is really uh, going to be the platform. If you want, we have, uh, as Europeans, uh, um, and, and you, you, you might have been involved in that, we had uh, over the last two decades probably, uh, notably with the flagship research project Civitas, we have had many, many remarkable examples of cities progressively transforming their, research, their transport system. And, and this was available for others to look at. Um, the dissemination impact has been, I, I would argue, real but limited in scope. And I think the, the real beauty of this mission, which is now the new platform for uh, urban um, mobility for urban related investments and research and in urban mobility as well is that not only will these 100 cities demonstrate that it can be done but we will also ensure and there's a platform which is in place that we connect the work in these 100 cities with all other interested cities in europe i mean particularly the 250 which we did not retain uh, or which, which at this stage were not retained but i think many others as well so i think that will really be a, a, a if we get it right, and we is not the commissioner, it's also the commission, but it's the cities, the national authorities, the local authorities, if we get it right, we will have a massive impact in lowering CO2 emissions. I mean, these, uh, cities rep these 377 cities applying represent 20% uh, of EU emissions. Though. So in case they're all transformed, this would be a massive uh, additional um, beneficial impact. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not double counting. I, I'm not on greenwashing myself uh, <laughs> in the sense that uh, part of this reduction is, of course, also anticipated in the 55% uh, target under sectorial analysis. But still, a full transformation of 100 cities and leading uh, many more um, uh, will, will no doubt make a big difference. So I think that's really the, the, the way to go. I wanted to react to two other, if you allow me, uh, Yanis, to two other points you made, which I think are really uh, super important. The first one is um, uh, personal uh, mobility patterns are entirely different if you live in a city or in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, needs to be entirely taken into account. So in particular, when we drive um, standards or, or regulations. Uh, it, it is, I think, well understood that it's different, but it is not always so straightforward to really prioritise also, um, uh, also um, uh, mobility outside big cities. Uh, and uh, you, you can see that politically this is absolutely essential now. Uh, I mean, I'm French myself. Uh, I can tell you this was at the heart of the French presidential elections. How do urban territories and rural territories fair with the transformations uh, related to climate and many others, of course, as well, but this one quite centrally. Uh, and therefore, I think the solutions which we deploy need also to fully take into account uh, these, these challenges. But at the same time, uh, and, and, and I'm thinking here particularly, of course, of fossil-driven cars or, or, or fossil fuel and fossil engines, uh, and they will have to still be available for quite a bit of time, uh, including and probably in particular here. But here also, I find sometimes that our territory, territories um, outside cities are not innovative enough. Uh, I have one recent example of a, of a, of a, of a region in France, um, they, they were trying to promote uh, that people use their bike coming into the city 10, 15 kilometers out, perfectly feasible with electric bikes today, I think. But of course, the road getting into the city was a narrow road uh, with no, no bike lane. And, and, and the worst is that part of that road was in fact a four-lane road because of traffic during the summer. 
So, uh, so, and the investment was to continue to make it a full road, a full lane road for traffic in the summer. Whilst I think there was, there would be here, no doubt, space for looking at it a, a little bit differently. But this again, I think, needs a, a real discussion between citizens, not just traffic planners, but between citizens, so that different needs can really come together. And then the last comment is on remote working. I mean, this is of course, uh, this is a game changer. And this, in contrast, I would argue to the limited uh, longer term duration of, our, our, of, our, of the way we were looking at food eh, during the lockdowns, this will stay. Uh, not, of course, at the scale we had eh, during the lockdowns, but it will stay. I mean, in the Commission, for example, uh, we will um, ask colleagues to be in the office two days a week. This will, because we also need to interact with one another, as we're doing here in the <laughs> studio. Uh, but for the rest, I think mostly people will have the flexibility of telework, which also creates flexibility at the mo for the moment you go into the office and the means of transport you can use to go to the office. And I think we are not special. Huh? Many other um, employees are doing the same. There's a real silver lining here. It's not completely straightforward uh, because I think CO2 emissions from heating your home uh, uh, are not always captured uh, when you look at it. Huh? But, okay, that's uh, a slightly different discussion. In terms of mobility, I think uh, we absolutely need to also reduce the need for mobility and remote working is a key, key, key component. Indeed. Very quickly, Janice, Anika, would you like to ask a question, make a comment? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question regarding uh, the expected changes regarding traffic in the cities. All we are hearing is that there are too many cars, traffic congestions, and uh, what we are uh, proposing actually is to replace those cars with electric cars. We are al always hearing uh, support financially buying those electrical cars, which will then yeah. replace the old ones. I think, or I have not heard, that we are planning to support uh, e-bikes, e as you say, e-scooters, and everything in between, because in my opinion, that would also require less infrastructural changes, less chargers on roads, less big roads. And uh, what is your view on that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a very important point. Let us, let us, not, uh, let us not forget uh, about uh, accessibility, because not everyone can, can use that. So, but that's a, that's, a, that's, a very, that's a very important point. Uh, um, you were saying, you were talking about the, the, the cleaner cars. If, if the Commission proposal is followed, by 2035 there will be no new, uh, all, let us put it in positive, all new cars will be zero emissions. And this, this is a challenge that I hope our member states, our governments, the governments of all of us, and the European Parliament will, will agree, because this will be an incredible change from all perspective, in innovation, for the business, for the citizens, and that's important. You also mentioned, rightly so, uh, the, the, the importance of internalizing the cost of transport. And I'll, I'll spare other details, but you know our so-called ETS system, the carbon markets where, where, where you pay for what you emit. We have just proposed that not only we tighten that for aviation, but also that we cover the road transport. Ah, but this will increase the price for some. Coupled with that, we have proposed that we have a social climate fund so that the most vulnerable users of transport, whether because they live in rural areas, because they have lower income, because other reasons, with the yieldings of this carbon price on road transport, will be supported to have for example, as you were saying, uh, climate tickets, uh, vouchers for public uh, transport and things like this. Again, a call to our governments and our parliament to go for that, uh, for that um, solution, which I think is very good, both in terms of climate, of innovation and of social well-being. On electric cars, I'm personally uh, very, very happy that at long last we decided that, yes, this is a relevant solution because it gets us to mass production. But I also agree that this is not the solution. I mean, firstly, uh, I mean, Clara in her previous position was deciding to invest more into other types of batteries, one which use much less rare uh, materials, uh, and we are, and research is happening on that. I think we will have different batteries uh, when we get to 35, when this will be massively uh, rolled out at scale. At least uh, the research is ongoing to get us there. But, I, 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 but then it's also absolutely clear that uh, if you replace uh, all uh, diesel cars or gasoline cars by electric cars, you, you don't solve much. Huh? 
So we absolutely need what you said, uh, other alternative forms of mobility. I'm speaking of cities now. Huh? Uh, for, for the rest of our mobility patterns, it would be a game changer, hydrogen or electric. Huh? Um, but, but for cities, we need much more. And, and what, the, what you have described, huh? what, you, what the consensus which you reached huh? in your, with your very different um, uh, background in terms of the, of, of the citizens you worked on, this is exactly the, the approach which is needed, the one which the cities will promote, I think. Very quickly on interconnections, because this is something that has been highlighted by our audience as well. Where are we and where are we going? Interconnections of? Of trains. Of trains. Well, we are not in a very good place, huh? <laughs> uh, that's for sure. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's certainly, I mean, and, and that's the problem. It's distinctly better than 10 years ago, but it's uh, distinctly not at all where it needs to be. So uh, the direction is, is, I think, very positive. Uh, rail transport has never been so high on, high on the mind of, of, of all of us as travellers. Um, and, uh, and now the rail industry, which is also an industry with long time frames, huh, uh, needs to uh, really up, uh, up, up its game. Uh, there is uh, so much which can be done by regulatory frameworks. They are essentially in place, frankly, it's now really for the industry to seize this amazing opportunity. It's an issue, of course, of very heavy investments in infrastructures. You covered that quite a lot, huh? we didn't react to that, huh? but you're absolutely right on this. Huh? I mean, and regional funding, recovery and resilience plans, are mm -hmm. Europe's co-funding into, uh, into these absolutely necessary investments, and rail infrastructure from that point of view is challenging. But it's also, I think, the, the, the rail industry is starting to, to, to change itself. Uh, you need innovation also in terms of services, how you use the infrastructure, when you use the infrastructure, and there's much more agility which is possible and which is a cultural shift which is progressively happening. But I concur, uh, the frustration uh, is, uh, is with me as much as with all of you. It makes economic sense. There is a demand, and I am sure that the industry is going to jump in. Thank you so much, Janice and Annika, for your contribution today. Before we uh, come to the end, I would like to remind you that all the conclusions that citizens came up with are in this report that is going to be published on the website. So make sure that you check it out so you learn more about all the different initiatives on energy, on food, and on mobility that citizens from all across Europe share with us. But stay, because we have... Just a, a conclusion in one second. So thank you so much again, Janice and Annika, and stay with us. I'm going to ask you what's coming next. Thank you for staying with us. We are back. And now I would like to show you something very special because over the past two hours, we had a graphic recorder who was drawing every discussion that we were having on energy and food and on mobility. So I would like to ask my team to show on the screen the result of the work that uh, this graphic recorder has done. So you can see they're reflecting the conversations that we had today on the just transition as a whole, the need to address inequality, the need to move beyond the uh, ideological questions, the need to bring together communities, more research and uh, more research and development, more uh, economic incentives uh, to make sure that we renew the buildings, which is one of the key elements uh, to reduce energy consumption as well. Uh, the support for renovation, more awareness campaigns so that people are aware of how can they contribute to the transition to a greener energy system. We talk a lot about sustainable food as well. As you can see here, we see reflected the five pillars that Miroslav talk about. The need to improve and to make more accessible uh, local production, to uh, make sure that we have a clear regulation on sustainability so uh, that we reach, uh, that we, we, we raise more awareness so that people are informed and they can't uh, consume in a better way. Uh, so we minimize waste as well, which is also very important. And we have more investment and subsidies uh, to uh, ensure that producers can also do uh, their job in a more sustainable way. We need a radical transformation of the agriculture on an animal farming system. And we, de we do need as well a better consumer culture that we see more and more coming up. We see more demands of a more sustainable food system. So this is something that we will be uh, seeing pushing more for more policy changes.
And last but definitely not least, this is the conversation we were just having about mobility and having both solutions for short distance and long distance for rural and urban areas, better planning, make sure that we uh, put an end to traffic jams and that we have more options for mobility. Uh, we do worry about the impact of uh, transport on climate change because it's one of the biggest contributors to pollution. So we need to make sure that it's more sustainable, greener and safer for everybody. Thank you so much to our graphic recorder for that beautiful representation of the conversations that we had today. Before we come to an end, I'm going to ask my speakers for a final word. I want to know what's coming next. What can these citizens that have participated in these dialogues expect from the Commission? Maybe, Clara, you would like to go first. Um... Citizens' demand is crucial. We know countries where there is not, not such information informed citizens, this does not work. So first thing is we will continue and reinforce the dialogues with all the citizens. Uh, stay tuned. For each, each initiative that the Commission launches, there is an open consultation. And I can tell you, we take it seriously. So stay tuned. Reply. Come to us. and. Um, Go and talk to your members of parliaments and your governments because the pressure in the noble sense of the word makes miracles. So if we all join forces in the same uh, direction, we will succeed. Think of the motto of the Climate Pact. My world, my action and our planet. Let us go for it. Derek. Yes, I think um, keep it up. Uh, I, I sometimes speak of the Greta miracle. I very much think that uh, the mobilization um, of our kids um, in 18, 19, still today, is really shifting politics. So you need to continue to mobilize. But I think what is really to be, to, to be retained from, from today is that, um, it, as Clara said, it makes a difference when you engage. I think on us, uh, as, um, as supporting politicians and as, uh, as, as public administrations, I think what we need to do is to, is to do more work with citizens. So not engagement. Uh, I, I mean, of course, the word is important, but I prefer the notion of co-designing policies and implementation plans. We need to do more of that. As said, technology gets us so far. Regulation gets us so far. But at the end, it is uh, what we want as a society which will make the difference, and we need to be part of uh, the choices made on this uh, deep transformation. So you will see much more of uh, many more platforms around the missions, around research projects, around the climate ambassadors, and many more initiatives. And uh, we need to show that not only we're doing it, we will need to continue to show that we are listening, not just today in the studio, but listening, as Clara said, by taking up what we hear, and then, uh, of course, also make this known. And that's probably the maybe more difficult part of it. But continue to engage and thank you so much um, for your amazing uh, ideas and energy throughout the process. Thank you so much. Um, so you have heard from our speakers, the conversation keeps on going, the fight continues. You can go and check the website of the European Commission. There you can become a Climate Pact Ambassador or you can make your pledge on how you would like to contribute to a greener, more sustainable world. Maybe you would like to organize yourself a peer parliament. The website of the IG Clima tells you how you can do it so that you can keep on having that conversation with your family, with your friends, and you can contribute your ideas, your proposals, so that we are all part of the solution. You can also follow Life Today and Tomorrow, the last uh, platform on the Conference on the Future of Europe, where citizens all across Europe are going to be discussing. And I would like to thank uh, our interpreters today, the technical team that made this event possible that you cannot see, but it's important that they are behind the scenes. And especially, I would like to thank all of you for watching and those citizens, those thousands of citizens that contributed to the conversation that we had today. Thank you so much for staying with us. And as I'd like to say, stay safe and save the planet.